Yo, what's up everybody? So today we're talking about film because the film community is getting a little bit bigger and it's always interesting to have questions and people ask you things uh, about what you should do or what you shouldn't do, how you do it and stuff like that. So today I'm gonna give you some points on to post-processing or AKA development when it comes to film and film photography. So let's get into it, roll the intro. I'm gonna show you some stuff and how I do it. Let's go. Okay, so let me give you the hook so you stick around. So today we're talking about home development when it comes to film and why you should be home developing over lab scanning when it comes to film photography and developing your negatives. Um, so I'm gonna show you some stuff, like I said, I've got some things I wanna talk to you really quick about. Um, hopefully this video doesn't go too long, but I also wanna give you enough detail into why I do what I do and why I think you should. So without further ado, let me show you some stuff. The first things first, let's talk about this guy. It is essentially a big t-shirt uh, with a zipper on the bottom and a little Velcro strap. Basically, this is your changing bag, this is your darkroom. So uh, back in the day, we would obviously set up lights and a lot of people, I'm sure, professionally do this. But for home development, this is all you need. So you can get this on Amazon, it's super cheap. Um, basically, like I said, it's just two layers of fabric um, that has a zipper on the inside, hopefully I can show you that, and then your uh, Velcro slap, or strap to go over the top. It's just got like three little pins, so you would fold it over just like that. And then basically, once you have all of your gear, all the things that you're going to handle in the film uh, development inside the bag, you put your arms inside it and you're doing all of this motion uh, without being able to see it. So that is definitely the hardest part when it comes to film photography and lab scans, or uh, film development home scanning, because uh, you can't see what you're doing when it comes to the changing bag. Uh, but don't let that be a, a, a barrier for you because Basically, you will figure it out. Over time, you just get a little bit better with it. Um, at first, it is kind of daunting and it'll take you a little bit of time. Sometimes it could take you a half hour, maybe a little bit longer. Sometimes you'll nail it first try and it'll take you minutes. So um, yeah, this is the, the dark room for home development. Like I said, super cheap and I completely recommend this one. Um, I just got it on Amazon. It'll help you out. The next little piece of gadgetry that I want to show you is the Patterson tank. So this is where development happens. This is probably one of the coolest little things that I've ever bought because of what it can do and it is super simple. So essentially you have your lid here and then you have this little uh, container on the inside where you're pouring your chemicals into. Hopefully you can see into that a little bit. It just has the hole into the bottom. So it, you'll hear the click in a second, watch this. So you hear that? Yeah, so that's what actually makes it light sealed. So you would undo this, and on the inside we have our film reel and a little spindle on the inside of that. So you have where you're actually putting your film into, and then you're gonna push this through it. This is actually gives you the ability to spin it when it's inside the Patterson tank. Um, this is the difficult part. So essentially you have two little uh, divots in the actual reel, and you're putting your film through it. So you're doing this motion a whole lot. It's just for as long as it takes you. Uh, this is the toughest part because there's two little ball bearings, basically. I think I can make you see that, hopefully. Yeah, there you go. So there's your little divot, and you can see the ball bearing right here. So you're basically pushing your film through, doing this motion, and then when you have it completely spooled up, you just put it into your empty Patterson tank here. Mine's a little dirty because I overuse it. Uh, so it sits in just like that. Then you'll take your actual top, the part that I said creates the light seal, and push that in there. Click it till you hear that little snap, put your lid on, and you're ready to start developing. So obviously this is one of those pieces that I was saying that goes inside the dark bag or in the changing bag because this is the part where it is light sensitive, where your film is. So you want to make sure that you're doing this part in the changing bag. Don't forget it outside your changing bag or else you're gonna have a little bit of a problem. Um, I've done this before, it's not detrimental, but it is a pain in the butt to take your hands out, fiddle around to get it inside the bag without obviously all the pieces, but yeah. So this is the Patterson tank. 
So this is the part where we're talking about development itself. I have just the developer here. The C41 process comes in three different uh, chemicals. You have your developer, your Blix, and your stabilizer. So this is just developer here. This is the mixed chemical. It's ready to go. It's ready to be used. Um, you can see I just have a janky little label right here where I've taped on developer. Um, but one thing that I want to tell you about this process is if you need to learn how to do it, it's super easy. The, the C41 kit comes with instructions, but when I first started, uh, you just type in that little search bar, how to C41, how to develop color film. There's tons of good content, so I don't want to run through all that with you, but I just want to show you this. So when you're talking about saving your uh, chemicals, these chemicals only last so long, like a couple of months, maybe two, three months. You, sometimes you can push it maybe, but really, realistically, it's about two months, three months if uh, if they're sealed properly and in good containers. So if you put it in a Coke bottle, it's probably not going to last too long, um, even though a Coke bottle would seal pretty well. But I typically go for glass, but let me give you this little tip when it comes to developing. So we have the kombucha bottle here, and the glass, excellent. It's brown glass, so you don't get a whole lot of light through the actual glass, which is good to break down the uh, chemicals inside um, your development. However, these actually have really small necks. So the seal is actually really good because you get that cap and you get a twist on. But for these themselves, the problem with the kombucha bottles, if you're going to get something like this, I definitely recommend brown glass. Uh, it's good for your chemistry, but... Uh, the problem with these is that we actually have such a small neck inside the bottle. So let me show you what I do usually when I'm uh, pouring them in and out. So I have like three or four of these just funnels, right? And they would just sit in there so you're able to pour back your chemicals into the bottle. However, you can see how tight that makes a seal. It basically makes an airtight seal. So you get a lot of glug, 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 glug and a lot of mess. So I would recommend some other bottles. I'm gonna pop them up over here because uh, I know what I'm talking about right now, but I don't have them on me. Uh, they're plastic with a seal, but they're black bottles and they have a red top and you're able to crush the bottle to get the air out of it. These are pretty good because I don't have a whole lot of air inside the bottle, but as far as this instance, it's a pain because you wanna to try to like save as much of your chemical as you can. And with this process, uh, it's not the best. So I. I, I would either recommend those plastic bottles or if you're going to do kombucha bottles like these, something with a bigger uh, neck or even a smaller funnel maybe, but I would still recommend the bigger neck. Let me show you some other stuff. Okay, so let me show you a little bit of unnecessary equipment, but it might help you out too. And this is what I do, and I've seen a lot of people use this, but I've also seen people just use... Um, like hot water out of the bathtub. So what I like to do is I'll fill this guy up to about where you can see the line here just over this is essentially just an electronic water heater um, i have it attached to the bucket itself and then i fill the water up i turn this on to 120 or whatever the temperature is and i let it sit for 10 minutes 15 minutes and usually it works perfectly fine i haven't had any issues with it the only problem with this system is that if you uh you want to start high with your water temperature and bring it down and just let it sit there at whatever the temperature is uh, versus having like a cold water or a room temperature water because it takes longer to heat the water than it does to let it drop. So usually what I do is I crank the heat on the bathtub, fill this to where I want it, and then let the, uh, the heat of the water come down to where it's supposed to be versus trying to get the water temperature up. But what's really good about this system is that it will hold it there for as long as I need it to. So if I fill up the water and I need to go do something, uh, this will sit there and like continually stir the water and keep it at that perfect temperature that I need it for film development. Um, so this little system I have here is completely not necessary, but it helps. And a lot of people, what they usually do will just take their bottles, stick them under the, the faucet in the bathtub and just let the water run. This is absolutely perfectly fine. It just uses a whole lot more water and I'm a little eco-friendly or I try to be, even though I do film development, which is not eco-friendly. But yeah, this is my one way to mitigate a little bit of water use. And the last piece that I want to show you about film development is this right here. So this is actually a completely different system. Uh, this is for black and white film. This is the Cine Still D96 uh, Mono Bath Chemicals. You can buy this in the uh, pack like this. This just has the dry chemicals and then you would mix yourself. Or you can buy on Cinestill's website the actual jug that has it already pre-mixed. This is a little bit cheaper, maybe $15 versus $20 for the mixed thing. Um, it's essentially both the same thing, but if you want to save a little bit of money, 
this is perfectly fine because it gives you the same instructions on how to mix it. You're essentially, you get a single uh, container mix, two or three bags, I can't remember how many is in this, I think there's two bags, and you just pour them in with the, with the water temperature. It doesn't have to be hot water, it can be, um, but it gives you all the instructions. And again, if you need this process explained to you, type in that search bar, how to D96, how to uh, develop uh, black and white film. This is specifically for black and white. It's not for color. Um, but yeah, so if you want to see this one, make sure you hit that little search button up there and it'll come up with tons of content for how to run this process. But I wanted to give you this idea as a tip for getting into film photography because the black and white film is incredibly easy. Not saying that C41 is difficult, but if you're looking for just a like plug and play sort of idea of black and white film is the way to go. And the second part of basically three parts when it comes to film development is the scan itself. So I use the Epson V600. It's a flat lay scanner. You can get several uh, different versions of the same thing, or you don't have to use this at all. I completely recommend it because it is very simple to use. It's like that same idea, that plug and play. Um, essentially, when you're putting your, your film into the scanner because you're wanting to upload it digitally, this is how you go from that film negative to getting a film positive and then being able to upload digitally. But I recommend this one because it's super easy. I found a couple of people that were using them and they recommended them. So I started using it when I got into it and I haven't had any problems with the scanner itself. However, in the film process, one of the biggest parts that people don't realize when it comes to scanning their film that causes a lot of problems is the actual software. So it's not the scanner that's usually a problem, It's it's been the software for me. I don't know about anybody else, you can leave your comment and let me know if you've had the same problem or a different problem. But so Epson puts out their own scanning software. It's called Epson Scan or Epson Scan 2, depending on your machine that you're running, whether it be Mac or PC or uh, operating system or whatever. Uh, but what I've had problems with that is the scans just come out a little bit bland. And it's also, I've had problems actually running the software when it comes to the V600. And I know the V600 works because it turns on its scan last week, but today it won't work um, just with the software, it won't connect. So what I did is I did this. The Epson scan software is completely free, so if you're just getting into it and you've already spent money on other things, completely use it because whatever, as far as flat scans go, you can adjust that in Lightroom or Photoshop after the fact if you want to. But if you want superior quality for your scanning uh, program, I think, go with ViewScan. So it's about $100, but for me, it's flawless, and the uh, the scans after the fact come out so much better starting out. So that's the problem, I think, with Epson Scan is that when we start off with Epson Scan, we get a flat image, and then we have to do a lot of doctoring in Lightroom after the fact, versus ViewScan, where I feel like, and this could be completely me, but I feel like ViewScan actually gives you a better negative to positive, and then gives you that, uh, uh, just a better process when it comes to scanning. So you end up with a photo that you have to do a little bit less or sometimes significantly less in Lightroom because it did it right in the scanning. And a lot of times that's the problem with film photography when we're talking about um, like blurry or muddy negatives that don't look right or the colors are off or whatever the case is and we put it into our scanning software and it comes out like that and you're like what happened to my camera like what did i do wrong but on the other side we like once you do it enough and you use a couple of different softwares you can realize that it's somewhere in the scanning process like you did perfect with a camera but the scanning has messed up somewhere so what you need to do is look at your software uh after, well, first, you need to look at your scanner, make sure that you don't have any smudges on the actual glass, make sure you've cleaned your negatives really well, and then beyond that, look at your software. So for me, it was definitely the software that I just didn't like, and then I started using ViewScan, and I've loved it ever since. Um, like I said, I'll leave a link. It'll be in the bio down below if you wanna check it out. Uh, yeah, so I completely recommend view scan when it comes to actually scanning and the process you got to use for uh, film photography, both color and black and white. Both have come out amazing. I love them both. So the third part of this process is actually just playing with your photos and editing them up like you normally would in Photoshop or in Lightroom. So this, when it comes to scanning, it is paramount that you get the right DPI, which means... Uh, 
scanning at a, at a resolution that makes sense. It doesn't mean cranking it out to 6400 just because you can, because it's not really necessary. Um, on the other side, you also don't want to scan it like 64 DPI. And if you need some more information on that, again, there's a big search bar. Check it out. If you want me to go over it with you, I absolutely will. But there have been people that have talked about it way better than I ever will. Uh, but yeah, DPI is something you need to look out for. And then also your file format. Use TIFF because it gives you the most data inside your file. Once you've done that, it moves directly into Lightroom. And from there, you can operate with it just like you normally would with your digital photos. A lot of people don't realize that you can edit really uh Pretty much the same way you do digitally, um, the effects and the clarity and all of those things that you would do in Lightroom or Photoshop operate almost the exact same way. Some of them um, will operate a little bit differently just because of the format in which it is. But if you mess with the highlights and, and shadows sliders in Lightroom and you're familiar with seeing your background get a little darker and your foreground get a little bit brighter... It works the exact same way. So that's a huge part of film photography. And when you're talking about home development and scanning and editing. So I said all of that to say this, that home development is the way to go for me. And I hope it is for you too, because it gives you that end to end control from initially taking the photo and then uh, developing and scanning, editing, and then you have your final photo. Development process is super easy. I know I probably over explained that. Um, but it's super, super easy. I don't want to discourage you in that fact. And I think home development is where it's at because you're able to get your negatives to where they're shareable pieces of content so much faster than lab scans. However, I think one thing that people think about with lab scanning is that the quality is a ton better and it, it definitely could be, it definitely could be. And here's the reason. So when you're dealing with lab scans, you have professionals who do this day, day in, day out, and they're running machines that are uh, tens of thousands of dollars. So you have proficiency and extremely expensive equipment. Of course, it's going to come out really well. However, the thing with the end-to-end -end control is, I think with home development, you get to, uh, you shot the photo. So when you're going into development and scanning, you get to adjust those things and watch them change as they happen versus like uh, lab scans where you try to put in some input. So if you've ever been to the dark room and I absolutely love the dark room, the lab scans are amazing. Um, if you've ever done that process, you know they have like a little box that says push or pull film by a stop, two stops, and then they have a comment box and you can add in uh, what you may want with your uh, negatives. But for me, I like having end-to-end -end control because I get to adjust those things on the fly, especially with scanning, um, that will give me control that I couldn't get necessarily at the darkroom because I'm not the one doing the scans, right? Um, they're amazing for like having that professional do your scanning for you and doing your scans. I just like being able to control that, and I think being uh, able to have that gives me a little bit more of an edge when it comes to film photography because I'm able to go from beginning to end. I had everything to do with it, so I get to manage those things or, or fix little pieces uh, throughout the process if I feel it necessary. So the other thing that comes with film photography is the time that it takes, and this is why I like home development over lab scanning, and I think maybe if you're looking into film photography, this is why you should also is the fact that with film development, we're talking about a lot of time. So it took a lot of time to uh, take your photos. You obviously don't get to see them right away and you have to do all the process to get them ready to be shareable pieces of content. Um, but with film, when you're talking about lab scans, there's a huge amount of time from the time it takes you to send them off and have them scan and return to you. Now, the darkroom is really great about actually giving you digital scans in an email, or uh, they give you a link in your email to where they've actually uploaded the scans. These are amazing. I did a, a TikTok about it, and I showed some of the preview scans, and they were amazing. And then after the fact, you wait a little bit of time, they send you back your negatives, exactly how they have uh, scanned them, or yeah, exactly how they've uh, develop them, which is amazing. It's just a lot of time. It took several weeks to actually get the photos back to me. So when it comes to home development, I can go out in the morning and shoot. And by the end of the day, I have shareable pieces of content as long as my editing didn't take a ton of time, which it usually does. Um, so one of the biggest points when it comes to home scanning when cost at least is other than the 
uh, the actual initial startup is the fact that the chemicals cost significantly less than what you're actually paying for when you're talking about uh, lab scanning. So just as like a quick tidbit, it was about 30 or 40 bucks last summer was the last time I sent off a uh, film to the dark room. And I think it was three rolls, 40 bucks, something like that. And it took several weeks, maybe three weeks or so from the time that I actually sent it to the time that I had my film back in hand. Somewhere in between that, they actually had it scanned and sent me digital copies. And I made a TikTok of just uh, preview images. Um, and they were really, re they were great. They were excellent. They were perfect scans. Great. It took some time though to get them back to me so I could actually do the scanning myself and actually do some edits on them. But yeah, absolutely go that route if you're thinking about um, getting into it and you're not sure that uh, the upfront cost is really worth it yet. Definitely work it like work with a lab. However, if you've already done this for a period of time and you're enjoying it, I definitely recommend home scanning because or home development because it eliminates a lot of the cost in the long run. So say three rolls or so for 40 bucks, the chemicals themselves have a cost and you're obviously every few months buying more because they do go bad. Um, but it's not like, it's not a binary, like works, doesn't work. It's more like it works. Re it's more like a scale. So it's perfect. And then eventually it just diminishes off. Um, so it's not something that you're going to notice right off the bat, but eventually your scans will look a little weaker. They'll look a little, uh, underdeveloped and you can tell what, uh, underdeveloped under development looks like, um, because the scan just doesn't look like it was, or the, the negative will look a little light versus when it was like purely contrast, you get those really dark, dark, light lights kind of thing. So you'll see that diminish over time. And that's when you know you need more. Um, but other than that, once you have your startup cost and you have your chemicals and everything, you can do, I think the box actually says 16 rolls for the life of the chemicals. I've done so many more than that. Um, because to me, that diminishing value, there's a point at which I probably wouldn't do it anymore. But at that point, I can buy another box of chemicals for... I think a bag was 30 or 40 bucks for the C41. And like I said, with the black and white, it's either 15 or 20. So that's 16 rolls minimum that I can do with those two kits versus three or four for almost the same price. So when it comes to cost, I think home scanning is the way to go, especially when you're talking about longevity in the game when it comes to film photography. So I know this has been a super long video and I had a ton of content, a ton of information, but I hope you guys like this style of content because for me, this is what I like seeing. These are the kinds of things that I'll put on and listen to in the car because I know the talking head interview style isn't super engaging when it comes to visuals. Um, but this is information that I think will absolutely help you out when it comes to starting into uh, film photography or moving into film photography when you're thinking about all of the process and all of the things. Hopefully I gave you some pretty decent little tips and tidbits and tricks, things that I've learned that will help you out and help you to avoid those same mistakes. If any of this has helped you out, if it's been remotely interesting, I hope you will hit that little thumbs up button and push a like. That way uh, my con uh, content gets pushed out to more people that would appreciate this kind of stuff. Um, this is a brand new channel, so it helps me out a ton when you do stuff like that. If you like this kind of content, if you'd like to see more tips, tricks, whatever, leave me a comment below. Let me know what you're thinking about. I'll absolutely make some more content for you guys. Um, if you want to, definitely hit the subscribe button too because then I can like push out content, you get to see it, and I get to like make more content for a lot of people, which is awesome. Anyway, thank you so much for checking all of this out. I'll see you in the next one. Peace out and later.